colleagues, I think we'll get started. I think uh, everybody's here, the key people are here. So again, good evening to our Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Coupe, uh, members of Executive, I see Professor Struer is here from Senior Management. I see um, Professor Susan Attendorf and Chair of School, Professor May is here, and members from the uh, engineering faculty, as well as HOD Ronnie uh, Weaver Youngman. And certainly we'd like to welcome the Murray and Roberts team that came this evening. Really appreciate your time out here. And of course, certainly led by the CEO, um, Mr. Henry Last. Thank you, sir. And thank you for the support we have um, from Murray and Roberts. And this is a very great occasion for us to launch another industry chair. I was just saying today, tonight we'll be launching our 19th chair in, the, in our faculty. Um, that's from industry and our government-sponsored uh, chairs we have in the faculty. So it's a great achievement for us this evening and really appreciate the support we get from industry. And the support we have from industry over the years has been largely due to the involvement of the different departments, uh, what we have is called advisory boards. So the advisory boards of all the different departments and the faculty have been very instrumental in setting up the partnership and relationships we had with industry over the years. Um, as you know, we graduated over 20,000 alumni in our faculty. And uh, of course, they uh, right through the, the world, not only in South Africa. And certainly, Mr. Lassie is one of our alumni as well. So it's great having you here again this evening. So without further ado, um, I'll call upon our Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Tawana Kupe, to do the welcome and to share his message. Professor Kupe. Looks like I'm not tall enough and not short enough. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Maharaj. A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to join Professor Maharaj in saying this is a joyous occasion for us. He said there are 19 industry chairs in his faculty, I think the highest in the university. Officially, we say 31, but I think that in recent days, we might have crept up another three chairs, so more like 33 or 34 but still that will be more than half what the university has. So if I may start, members of the executive, I see Prof. Anthony Stroh here who is instrumental in negotiating many of our chairs. Professor Sunil Maharaj, Dean of the Faculty of Engineering, Built Environment and Information Technology, the Chief Executive of Mary and Roberts, Mr. Henry Lass, and an alumnus of the university and senior members of your executive team. The head of the Department of Mining Engineering, Professor Ronnie Weber Youngman, staff from and students and full-time postgraduate students from the Department of Mining Engineering, members of the UP staff here present, and members of the media and invited guests. Good evening again and welcome to this very important occasion, namely the launch of the Murray and Roberts Chair in Industry Leadership 4.0. Murray and Roberts is a long and proud heritage of more than a century and is today recognized as a multinational specialist engineering and construction group focused on the natural resources market sector. Murray and Roberts consists of a group of world-class companies and brands aligned to the same purpose and vision and guided by the same set of values. The group is operationally structured into three business platforms and delivers its capabilities in three primary market sectors, namely metals and minerals, oil and gas, and power and water. It provides a comprehensive service across the project life cycle from design and engineering to procurement, construction, commissioning, and maintenance. The group also provides services to high growth complementary market sectors on the regional capabilities and competitive advantages of his business platforms. I'm sure that the CEO of uh, Marion Roberts, Mr. Lass, will also, in his address, elaborate more on the core activities within the company. From the company background, it is obvious that Marion Roberts is a leading role player in the world with regards to engineering and construction. And it is great news that Marion Roberts is now fostering closer relationships with the University of Pretoria. The University of Pretoria 
and specifically the Department of Mining Engineering. As part of the Faculty of Engineering, the built environment and information technology is therefore grateful for the involvement and support of Marion Roberts with regard to research activities within the department. The partnership is formalized with specific reference to leadership within the mining and mining related industries through the establishment of the Marion Roberts Chair in Industry Leadership 4.0 within the Department of Mining Engineering. If we look at the challenges facing us in the future with regards to the fourth industrial revolution, it is evident that leadership and the implementation of new technologies will go hand in hand. The future will therefore entail leadership in cyber physical systems, cloud computing, the internet of things, and cognitive computing that will underlie the mechanization and modernization of workplaces. That is why these days we talk, people talk a lot about the future world of work and jobs that are being created by these developments that we do not yet know. In this context, leaders will necessarily have to contend with increasingly complex decision making while exercising emotional intelligence and simultaneously having an impact in the ability to inspire, motivate, and deal with this complexity in a volatile, uncertain, complicated, and ambiguous world. More than ever before, we are entering a time when introspective leaders who continually challenge and develop their analytical ability and leadership effectiveness will be greatly needed. For enterprises to compete, grow, and create jobs, they must ensure that they have access to people who can lead in a world of high-tech innovation and disruptive technologies that will transform and is transforming many industries. Successful leadership development will be dependent on industry commitment to increase investments in innovation, to equip the workforce with relevant skills at all levels, and to deliver higher value goods and services successfully. Engineering is one of the careers that will be central to these highly technical landscapes. And as things stand now in South Africa, there are no pre-career leadership preparation and grooming for future leaders in this field. The Department of Mining Engineering has been running a Mining Engineering Leadership Academy for the last 10 years, which have been very favorably acknowledged and accepted as a key intervention by the Mining Advisory Board at the University of Pretoria. With the rapid and practically exponential advancement of technology in a volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous environment, the need to address leadership development on a wider scale in engineering, the construction industry as well as at university levels is at a critical juncture, ladies and gentlemen. The quality and understanding of the importance of leadership in the implementation of new technologies to enable companies to be more competitive and sustainable in terms of their growth strategy has already been identified as a key aspect for consideration in the future. It is my sincere opinion that the quality of leadership in future will be a game changer in distinguishing great companies from good companies. Some of the key interventions foreseen in this chair leadership are workshops, research in the adoption of new technologies, and related research journal article publications, in particular involving postgraduate student researchers as part of capacity building. Because one of the challenges we face is to create a continuous sustainable pipeline of a younger generation of leaders, skilled workforces, and educated people to take the enterprises into the foreseeable future. Through this support and involvement in the Marion Roberts chain, I believe it will also further position Marion Roberts as a leadership brand, not just at the University of Pretoria, but in the mining industry, industry and other industries as well, and globally and not just in South Africa and on the African continent. Marion Roberts, through their support in the establishment of the chair, have indicated their willingness to be part of this journey in leadership development, for which we are grateful. I therefore, in my capacity as Vice Chancellor and Principal at the University of Pretoria, 
commend and thank Mr. Lass as the Chief Executive Officer for his and his company's support in establishing the Industry Leadership 4.0 in the Department of Mining and Engineering. It is a known fact that universities can no longer operate in isolation and partnerships such as this academic research chair with Mary and Roberts is imperative to foster a true spirit of collaboration. I would like to conclude by highlighting that our ongoing work at UP across disciplines and areas of expertise is dedicated to bringing people to, together from different academic disciplines within South Africa, our continent, Africa, and globally to co-create transformative knowledge and practices. And crucially, for us to collaborate and partner with local and global institutions in society beyond the academy to create the South Africa and Africa we want and make positive contributions to the world that will underpin sustainable ways of being human in the world. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Professor Cooper, for those words. And of course, certainly, yes, as you can see, this chair is Industry Leadership 4.0, looking at the 4IR and beyond, and how engineering has transformed itself beyond the traditional way of doing things, and how we bring technology, and how we have bring the transdisciplinary and the multidisciplinary facets of work. And um, what Professor Cooper didn't tell you is that um, we, as a University of Pretoria, we produce in this country, almost 28.5% of the engineering graduates in this country. So almost one in three engineering graduates in this country is a Takis graduate. So we make a significant contribution to the high level skills base in this country. So it's very important for us to innovate ourselves all the time so that we always, as you know, in the S-curve, we're always in the top of the S-curve. So our graduates are highly marketable and of course meet the requirements of industry. So hence, this particular chair is going to add value in terms of the new skills that our graduates will have and the type of skills we hope to impart in the people that work in industry as well. So I'll in ask Professor Ronnie Weber Youngman, who is the head of mining engineering, who has, of course, also a graduate from this university, who has over the years developed a very good relationship and network with the different facets of mining uh, captains of industry, and he'll tell you about the large number of captains of industry that have come from University of Pretoria over the years. And Professor Rani. The Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Coupe, Professor Maras, the Dean of the Faculty, Mr. Henry Laws, fellow guests, people, uh, welcome to this evening. And and, and I'm very proud to say that um, there's a lot of alumni that came in this, this afternoon, which I'm very proud of. Um, if you look at the slogan that's on the, on the board, uh, hashtag UP Mining Matters, is that in the department, we've realized very quickly that it's not about the hashtag UP Mining Department that matters, but actually the whole of the university. Because there's a lot of uh, mining related uh, research work happening at the University of Pretoria and we're exploring that aspect even more aggressively next year. Because I do believe that hashtag UP mining does matter. If I look at uh, the situation in the context of um, something that also the Dean did not mention is that in terms of the academic ranking of world universities uh, in terms of subject ratings, in 2019, Web of Science data was used for mining and mineral engineering to rank the University of Pretoria in the top 100 worldwide. I think it's the first time that uh, we actually became a, a ranking number uh, in, in this context. And the criteria that was used is the quality of education, the quality of faculty, the research output, and per capita academic performance of the institution. And I'm again going to say, hashtag UP Mining does matter. The future of work as indicated by the principal and also by the dean, the dean is going to be very, very different in future. And it's very important that the university and specifically my department in this case 
had to adapt to this changing environment and make sure that we actually are ready for the future because the future of work is definitely going to be very, very different uh, and we need to align ourselves with that. At the World Economic Forum in 2016, there were certain skills identified that, that you need to thrive in the fourth industrial revolution. And I'd just like to mention them as they are because if you look at those skills, you will find that you have to have a technical skills and background, but at the end of the day, that the non-technical skills of which leadership is one is really making a significant contribution. Obviously, com complex problem solving is the first one, critical thinking, and they're not necessarily in a sequential order. Creativity, which includes entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship. People management, and in this case, also incorporating leadership, coordinating with others, and group work activities related specifically. Emotional intelligence, which is a very, very young um, way of thinking, and it's very important in the future. And then judgment and decision making. And then service orientation, negotiating, and cognitive flexibility. And if you go through that list, you will clearly see that the non-technical skills contribution to thrive in the fourth industrial revolution is actually quite more than the actual technical ability. I'm proud to say that the Mining Engineering Leadership Academy was established about 10 years ago. And the reason for this establishment was to really groom our final year students in such a way that our competitive edge was the way in how they deal with people and how they manage and lead according to their discipline. And we also then emphasized a lot of the non-technical skills awareness and that was what we said our final year students must take out of here, and that is what's going to make them very successful in future. Because the technical aspect and knowledge of their, of their academic career is non-negotiable. It has to be that. We actually started covering aspects such as self-awareness, interpersonal skills, conflict management, emotional intelligence, and ability to work in multidisciplinary settings. And the Mining and Engineering Leadership Academy has also been incorporated in Mine Design now, where 20% of the final mark is made up of the people skill side of it. And what is very nice in terms of what we've actually done in the department is that we actually want to optimize the, the team dynamics within the Mine Design environment. And I'll talk a little bit later about what it is that we also relate to in terms of the five generations or the four generations of work of people within that generation that we have to work with. What we do in the Mining Engineer Leadership Academy and specifically relating to the mine design is to use different sex and selection criteria such as gender, race, mining commodity, results from the disk analysis as well as Myers-Briggs and also academic results. And we then put the, the students into academic mine design groups in the way that they would actually complement each other in terms of the, actually the criteria that we set themselves out for. One of the important changes that we also started introducing this year is the socioeconomic challenges in and around mines, and such as community awareness, uh, responsibility, resettlement strategies, expansion plans, reskilling of the workforce, and post-mining activities also form very important parts of discussions or discussion points within the MILA framework. Now, I found an article um, at the beginning of the year which said that leading the four generations at work. It was an article by Jim Jenkins. And although the article is, is from an American perspective, it's very valuable in the context of understanding the different personality and work traits associated with different generations. And I've actually added a fifth um, a generation type at the end of this uh, PowerPoint just to indicate how quickly these things change. But it's the interesting fact is it's the first time in history that we have to manage and lead five generations at the same time at, at this, any specific point in time. The silence, according to the article, uh, have been labeled as the most loyal workers, highly dedicated, and also committed to teamwork, and also very much involved in proper uh, interpersonal communication skills. But unfortunately, they retired, and if we haven't recorded what they've taught us, it's actually been a loss. The 1946-1964s were the baby boomers, and I'm actually one of them, is the first generation that actively declared higher priority for work over personal life. 
and you will see as I talk how it actually changes and why I'm mentioning this as a game changer in terms of leading people in future. They're more optimistic and open to change than the silence and they are responsible for the me generation and very much in pursuit of personal gratification. And what is so important, what is so nice to see within this uh, comparison that I'm making is that we actually and our youngest, uh, younger graduates actually have to go manage in this environment. Then we got the Generation Xs, which is the 65 to 1980 born, and at the end of the day, they often concerned the slacker generation. Uh, they question authority figures and are responsible for creating work-life balance. So they're more into the work-life balance environment. And they're very strong on technical skills and more independent than the prior generations. And they're willing to develop their skill set and they're very adaptive to job suitability, uh, instability. And, and the reason why I'm mentioning this is can you imagine a young graduate being landing on a mine and actually not capable of being involved in understanding these different generations? Now the last one, which actually um, not, is not the last one, is the Generation Ys or the Millennials, 1981 to 94 born, is the first global-centric generation. And they have come up in an age with the rapid growth of internet. And they are amongst the most resilient in navigating change. And in terms of knowledge, they are the most educated generation of workers today. And the millenniums represent the most team-centric generation since the silence as they've grown up at a time where their parents program much of their life with sports, music, and recreational activities. And then the fifth one, which after this article was published, the fifth generation was then mentioned as well. And the fifth generation, or the I generation, or the generation Z, is the ones that were born after 95. And they are more focused, and if you look at what I've highlighted on the PowerPoint, they are more focused on work than millennials were at the same age, and they're more likely that they say, well, work, keep on working, even if they had plenty of money. Now, I don't think for the student money will ever be enough um, in terms of what they, that they earn. And I think at the end of the day, the I generation also are very concerned with safety, and they're very much more cautious in the way they deal with things, and they're less likely to take risks. And this is very much so. If you look at what happened at university, they socialize with their phones, and where the millenniums demand, demands praise, praise, the I generations want reassurance. And I, I just want to stop here, and, and I want to say something, that even in my department, we have actually almost in all of those generation types, someone in the department. And if you want to manage and lead, you need to understand your people and manage and lead them according to their strength. In conclusion from this article, they said that the strategy for cross-generational leadership is as follows. As these five generations, and I quote, continue to interact, companies can no longer assume that high pay, basic medical benefits and or benefits will secure the top talent. As more silence retire, baby boomers seek post-retirement careers, generation Xs demand challenging but balanced work assignments, and millennials, which is the generation wires, expect high perks in exchange for loyalty and technological savvy. Adding the generation Z that wants stability and reassurance, you need to know that leaders must find creative ways to recruit, and I've added in there, reskill and retain talent. So the future of leadership, and this is a small video that I also got from internet, and it amplifies what are the leader of 2030 going to look like. And if you look at what I've just said now in terms of the generations that we'll have to manage and lead in future, this video amplifies in a big way what it means to be able to be successful as a leader in a 2030 environment.
new set of skills for employees to be able to thrive in the fourth industrial revolution is non-negotiable, and leadership forms an integral part of it. The quality and the type of leadership will become a critical factor relating to all industries, with special emphasis also on the implementation of new technology. The development of these skills needs to be done at a very early stage of any employee's career. And we need to make a paradigm shift in terms of how we want to educate and train our future leaders in the context of what I've mentioned. Managing and leading diverse teams span over five generations are very different from the past and needs to be dealt with in a very different, unique, innovative way. And the Department of Mining Engineering with this MILA intervention recognized the need and exposes our students to leadership aspects that will serve them well in the careers to come. In terms of acknowledgement, I'd really like to thank personally Mr. Henry Lars for, for his support in helping to establish the Marion Roberts Chair in Industry Leadership. The University of Pretoria, and specifically the Dean, Professor Mirage, for support in the ventures in the department. And I'd like to add Dr. Johan Ace also being involved with the MILA program that, have been, that he has been running with us for the last three years. And my staff that supports our vision of having a key drive in leadership skills development that relates to activities in our department. I thank you. Thank you, Prof. Rani, for the for that overview and, of course, stressing the importance of leadership and the different kind of skills as outlined in the World Economic Forum. I think those are very important uh, aspects going forward. And, of course, um, we are trying to adapt all the time so that uh, in, even in engineering, when we ask why we need to teach engineering a leadership rather than teach engineering hardcore skills, and I think they're becoming just as important as learning how to write program, how to do stuff in statistics, or how to use MATLAB, or how to do uh, some C++ programming. Those are very important skills that we need to teach our students in different ways in mind design or integrated or multidisciplinary work. Um, the next part of the program is where <coughs> well, I'll call upon Mr. Henry Lars to give an overview of Murray Roberts and how he sees the chair. But before he does that, I'll give a short bio on uh, Mr. Lars. So Henry Lars first joined Murray and Roberts in 2001. He was appointed to the executive director board in April 2011 and became group chief executive on 1st of July 2011. He holds a B.Eng. mining degree from University of Pretoria and an MBA from the other university down the road we know as Witwatersrand. Henry was born in Freyhead in 1959. He started his career in 1984 with Genco and was appointed as the managing director of Kelgran Limited in 1994. He joined Murray and Roberts Group in 2001 as a managing director for Murray and Roberts RUC. And in January 2005, he was appointed managing director of Murray and Roberts Cementation following the merger of Murray and Roberts RUC with Cementation Mining to form the Murray and Roberts Cementation PTY Limited. In April 2011, he was appointed executive director to Murray and Roberts Limited and responsible for the engineering cluster until he took over the role as Chief Executive Officer for the Murray and Roberts Group in July 2011. He has extensive experience in the mineral resources and mining contracting environments, as well as a strong record of successful resolution of complex commercial matters, business strategy, and implementation. Henry has significantly improved the overall performance profile of Murray and Roberts, turning it into a global engineering and construction group. He was instrumental in the establishment of the cementation group as a successful and global business. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Mr. Lars. I must say I feel uh, very intimidated with professors all around me. <laughs> Professor Kopi, Professor Maharaj, Professor Weber Youngman, thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you this evening and also for the opportunity to share with you a few words about Marian Roberts. But before I do that, let me, let me just tell you that I remember very well when I started my studies here at Tux in 1980 
that was after two years of compulsory military training. <clears throat> and during that two-year period, I wasn't very close to the academia at all. And uh, walking around Tux in 1980, fortunately the university decided that it would be good to have a bridging course, especially for those students that uh, completed military training. Now, this was a course in science and maths, uh, which I then decided to, to attend. And I must tell you, I got the fright of my life and the shock of my life because by attending that first course, I didn't know what the lecturer was talking about. I got such a fright and uh, decided to, to not unnecessarily bring more stress into my life and rather not attend any more of those courses, enjoy the university life until the real lecture started. Which was a good decision because uh, I enjoyed those first couple of weeks and when the lectures really started, I climbed in and worked very, very hard and fortunately didn't do too badly at university, finished off well and uh, looking back with very fond memories. During those times, there was a, a, a young man that studied mining engineering with me. <clears throat> and that young man today is Professor Ronnie Weber, young man. He's not as young a man today as he was back then, but he's still a very, very active and powerful player in industry and still going very strongly. So, uh, Ronnie, very nice to be here with you guys again. So, Marion Roberts, if I could share with you a few words about Marion Roberts. And I did prepare a few notes just to make sure that I don't forget anything. So, Marion Roberts is a, is a household name in South Africa, and it is a company that has got a very, very proud history. And large parts of the infrastructure that you see in South Africa was established by Marion Roberts, uh, whether it's in the building space or civil engineering. And just to give you a few examples, the Carlton, one of the iconic buildings, the Carlton Center was built by Marion Roberts, which for many, many years was the tallest building in Africa. And I'm not sure today, Ian, maybe you know, uh, when was that no longer the tallest building? <laughs> it, with the one in Sandton. So it's actually only a recent, recent development. And then more lately, the how train, I would think, is the more prominent piece of infrastructure that was established by Marion Roberts. However, over the past 15 years, the company has transformed from being predominantly a South African civil engineering and buildings company to a multinational engineering and construction group. And um, I think that's where Professor Kopi also had a few words on that. But what we have in, in Murray and Roberts is a company that is really focused on three, on three market sectors, all in the natural resources market space, oil and gas, underground mining, and power and water. And each of these business platforms are named after the main market sector which it services. However, you must remember that there are also complementary markets which are important. As like, for instance, if you take the oil and gas platform, it would provide services into the oil and gas sector but also into the metals and minerals and the infrastructure space in the Australasian market. Um, of these three platforms, the underground mining platform is the largest of the three in terms of contribution to the group's earnings. And I would say probably a contribution currently of about 70 to 75 percent of group profit would come from the, uh, from the mining, mining business. And it is a recent, it is a recent development. Uh, Marine Roberts always had a small mining company called RUC and in 2004-2005 uh, we acquired the cementation group and eventually then established what we know today as, as this mining platform, underground mining platform in Marine Roberts and Ian Henstock is also in the audience and at that stage when we acquired the uh, cementation group Ian, Ian uh, was the founder of uh, uh, Bridge Capital, Ian, and at that stage was one of the executives in Bridge Capital, and Bridge Capital was the company that, that provided the financial uh, services into the acquisition of cementation, and Ian is with us in the audience and became a Marion Roberts executive after that and has been in the group for quite some time. And uh, each of these platforms is under the leadership of a business platform CEO, and in the audience is Mike Da Costa. Mike is heading up our underground mining business. 
the ease of Vitsi, but we won't hold that against you, Mike. <laughs> you must feel quite intimidated with all the tax guys around you uh, this evening. But ladies and gentlemen, three, three mining or three business platforms, and you, you will notice that the group today is very different to what it was 15 years ago. So the services that, the services that we provide in all three of these business platforms cut across the project life cycle. So essentially, Marion Roberts is a company that built projects. We built projects in the mining space. We built projects in the oil and gas space. We built projects in the power and water space and also then the complementary markets. And as you can see on the slide there for oil and gas, as an example, we provide services like detailed engineering on projects. We provide procurement services, construction services, commissioning and maintenance. And on the mining side, we also provide operational services, which means that we operate mines on behalf of our clients. Now, that's not something that um, <clears throat> we do for established multinational mining companies. It's more for the junior miners that don't have the capacity or the capability to operate the mine. We would build the mine for them, and then we would also operate the mines for them. And our objective is really to get to a point that about 50% of our revenue um, would come from contract mining or operating mines so that we are less exposed to the volatility of the mining commodity cycle. So that essentially is, uh, is sort of the type of services that we provide in each of the platforms. And if you look at this slide here, it gives you a feel of our geographic footprint. Uh, the mining business, I would say, is, is the most globally established business uh, relative to the other two platforms. And we essentially work in three regions, uh, South Africa into Africa, which is one region, and then Australasia that extends right up into Mongolia. Ulaanbaatar is the capital of Mongolia, and we're doing uh, the Oyotolgoi project there for Rio Tinto. And then in the Americas, we're essentially in Canada and in the U.S. And contribution to uh, profits within the underground mining platform, Mike, I would say probably 20 25% from South Africa and from Australia, and the rest would come from the Americas. <clears throat> Recent acquisitions in this business, uh, we concluded an acquisition in, in, in the U.S. last year and acquired a company called Terra Nova Technologies. Essentially, it is a company that provides logistics, logistical services um, in the form of crushes and screens and uh, conveyor systems, underground and open cost. Uh, we also acquired a 49% stake in Boipello, which is a joint venture in South Africa that provides contract mining services into the coal mining, coal mining sector. And we also acquired 30% stake in a company called Insect Technologies. This is in Australia, and this company is a specialist in the application of automation technology in the underground mining space. Just a few projects, uh, photographs of, of, of projects and and what we do within uh, the underground mining platform. What you see on the screen there is the cementation uh, training facility out at Bentley Park, which is close to Coltonville. And we do have uh, quite advanced technologies that we make use of in training our people. And I would think it is probably the top mining training center in South Africa at this stage. We, only, we not only provide training services to our own employees, but also to some of our clients, we extend the service uh, to them as well. Uh, on Friday this week, um, the board of Marion Roberts Holdings would be visiting uh, the Bentley Park training facility. It is something that we're really very, very proud of. And uh, as I said, I think the training that we provide there is second to none compared to what you can find elsewhere in the country. Uh, this is just a photograph of the Diabek diamond mine in the Arctic. In Canada, uh, it's, it's a mine that we've been providing services for for a very long period out of our offices in North Bay, Canada. What you see there is the Resolution Copper Mine in Arizona, United States. And uh, people would say, well, that is the, that is the Galloway uh, on, that, on that project. And uh, in South Africa, people would talk about the stage. But in America, they talk about the Galloway. In the oil and gas platform, it's also a multinational business, uh, primarily operating out of Perth, Australia, but we've recently acquired a company in Houston, and we do expect that the business in the Americas will, 
very quickly start to contribute more towards earnings uh, relative to the business that we have in, uh, in the Australasias. So that recent acquisition was of an EPC company uh, which is based in Houston and we are very pleased that shortly after we acquired the business we secured the first significant project uh, for that business in the order of about 9 billion rands order book value. This is a business which uh, played a very big part in establishing the Gorgon project on Barrow Island. It is off the west coast of Australia. Um, it's, it's, it's owned by Chevron. It's currently in operation and uh, they're starting to look at further trains as part of their expansion initiatives. But we also provide services into complementary markets through the oil and gas platform. This is a photograph of the Boddington gold mine in Australia where we've done quite a lot of work. And uh, this is the Mondering Ware Dam in Western Australia where Clough, which is the, the company within the oil and gas platform, the brand under which we are trading, where Clough played an important role to lift the, uh, the, the dam wall to increase the capacity of that dam. And then finally, uh, the power and water platform. This is a, a platform that's predominantly focused on, on sub-Sahara Africa. And as you can see, there's no footprint outside of South Africa or sub-Sahara Africa. And it's a business that um, is struggling at this stage to really establish itself after the mega build of the Madu Madupia and Kusile power stations. And those two power stations have really absorbed our capacity and capability over the past few years. And there's unfortunately not sufficient opportunity for us to maintain the business at levels of revenue and earnings and what we reported during the main build of Madupi and Kusile. We recently acquired a company called OptiPower, which is a company that specializes in transmission lines, high voltage transmission lines. And that was a successful acquisition and we see significant potential for that business to grow into the short and medium term future. A few photographs here. This is the Kusile power station. The work that we are doing there is essentially erecting the boilers, which are those large uh, structures that you see there, and also then building the equipment into the boilers which are supplied by the clients. Uh, this is a project that we did for Sasol. It is an oxygen, oxygen plant out at Zakunda, completed about a year ago. And uh, this is a photograph of a wastewater treatment plant. It's technology that we own called Organica, technology out of Hungary. And you guys that would know, it's not a pleasant experience to walk around a conventional wastewater treatment plant. It is smelly. It is it's just not a nice place to be. But this is, if you apply the te uh, Organica technologies, that's what you will see. The rest of it is all underground. And what you see there is what you will see, which, which is the above ground infrastructure. A fantastic technology. Um, this is a demonstration plant that we have out at Virulam, outside of Durban. And we're currently in negotiation with a V&A waterfront in Cape Town to relocate it from Virulam down to Cape Town and it will be utilized uh, by the waterfront. So hopefully that's something that we will be able to conclude in the not too far future. So uh, just a few comments in closing. So this is what I wanted to share with you about Marion Roberts. Now, why, why is Marion Roberts here and why do we play a part in this chair in Industry Leadership 4.0? You've heard Professor Ronnie talking about how technology is changing and it is changing faster and faster every day. And it is changing the way in which individuals, companies and governments operate. And for us as an organization, we need to understand what will be required for us to be successful in this future that lies ahead of us where, it, where technology will play such an important role. And more specifically, what would be required for us to be successful in the mining industry? I mentioned earlier on that, that our mining business contributes about 70 to 80 percent of our earnings. It's a fundamental part or a very important part of the Murray and Roberts Group. And uh, we need to understand better what this fourth industrial revolution is all about. The, the founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab, is the first guy that coined this term fourth industrial revolution when he used this as the theme for the 2016 World Economic Forum that was held in Davos. And he argues that there's a technology 
revolution underway. Under your noses, it's happening every day. Um, and, and, and he's the guy that, that's talking about, first it started to talk about the fourth industrial revolution. So I asked myself, now when did this actually start? When did this fourth industrial revolution start and what does it actually mean? And to be able to understand that a little bit better, you need to look just back in history and think what a revolution is. And what was the first industrial revolution, the second, third, and now we're in the fourth industrial revolution. Now the first industrial revolution happened in 1760 to 1840, over an 80 year period. And it was about mechanization, it was about water power, it was about steam power. And that entire revolution was really driven by the steam engine's invention and the role that that played in new manufacturing processes which led to the creation of factories. Now that, that was 1760 to 1840. It took about 100 years later for the second industrial revolution. So, so that followed the first industrial revolution a century later. That was about mass production, assembly lines, electricity. It was at the age of science and mass production of electricity, steel, oil, and automotive industries. The light bulb, uh, combustion engines were key inventions during that time. Now, so that would have taken us to about 1940, a century after the first industrial revolution. Not long after that was the third industrial revolution. It started in 1960. So these things are, these revolutions, industrial revolutions, are coming over us quicker and quicker and quicker. So in 1960 was the third industrial revolution. And that was about the computer and automation era, about digital revolution, the introduction of mainframe computing, personal computer, computers, and then the internet that was brought to the populace on a very, very large scale. It also marked the invention of the semiconductor. Now, in our organization, we recently started a process with the Boston Consulting Group. We talk about digitization and what that impact will have on our business and how we need to ready ourselves for the future. But uh, in doing this bit of reading, in preparing for this evening, I realized that the digital revolution is actually the third industrial revolution. We're already in the fourth industrial revolution. So we're trying to prepare ourselves as an organization for the digital revolution or digitization, but I mean, that's, that's already history. So when you talk about the fourth industrial revolution, now when did that start? As I said just now, the first time that, the, that this term was used was in, uh, was in 2016 at the, uh, at the World Economic Forum. So it is something that is happening as we speak. And people talk about artificial intelligence, augmented reality, energy capture, storage and transmission, the internet of things, 3D printing. And this technology is changing rapidly. So we need to understand what that would demand from us going forward from a leadership point of view, from a company point of view. How do we remain relevant in this rapidly changing environment of technology explosion and how do we make sure that we remain competitive and that how do we generate value how do we distribute value as organizations how do we function as individuals as companies how do we function within the fourth industrial revolution so for that reason we decided it would be a very good investment for marine roberts as a group uh, ronnie to support support you in this uh, in this initiative and, and hopefully that's for the best of industry and for the benefit of all of us. And uh, we really look forward to see what the fruits of this initiative would be. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Larson. Thank you again for giving us a nice expose on uh, Marion Roberts and where you see it going into the future. Um, so we have a little token of appreciation for you coming here and your team. So Prof. Rani, if you can please join me too. So now, um, 
We have basically, um, as you know, we signed the contract with Murray and Roberts. They already gave us the money as well, so we have the money already for the chair. Thank you, sir. So what do we do this evening? I'll call on uh, Mr. Lars and our Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Cooper, uh, to unveil the plaque, basically, to show, uh, recognize the celebration and a memoir as well for us to have in the facility. So if you can please, both of you, join us. Prof. Ronnie, can you help me there, please? So thank you again. Thanks very much for this, and it's great. And uh, so to conclude, I'd uh, basically like to thank all of you for a making time to attend this momentous event for us in the history of University of Pretoria and, of course, in the partnership with Marian Roberts. As you know, our Vice Chancellor and Principal is very, very passionate about the Fourth Industrial Revolution and how it takes UP to different heights. He has been looking, scanning the whole globe to see how University of Pretoria should position itself as an international global partner with African and South African relevance. And certainly this kind of initiative will add value and, and, uh, and contribute to his vision and strategy for taking University of Pretoria forward. I certainly like to thank our colleagues from the university, uh, our executive and senior managers and staff and students for attending. I really appreciate your time. And of course, the team from Marian Roberts, thank you very much from the mining, from the energy sector, and so forth. And we're hoping we could do some work with the guys as well. We have a very strong energy group at University of Pretoria. We host the National Energy Hub for the country uh, at University of Pretoria for the last 10 years. So we do a lot of work on optimization, energy efficiency, and, and policy development. So certainly, I think it'll be a great opportunity to strengthen that particular relationship. And of course, I'd like to thank the organizers for this evening, um, certainly our caterers, Louis and his team for the audiovisual and uh, certainly Professor Cooper for taking time of his busy schedule to be here with us. And I'd like to recognize at this point in time, Mr. Chris Griffiths from Angela Platt. Thank you very much for making time, sir, to be here. Again, one of our alumni from University of Pretoria and very supportive of mining and really appreciate your support and your, and your leadership as well in guiding us in taking the faculty forward. Colleagues, um, we have some refreshments, so please join us for some refreshments and we can network. And thank you again and travel safely. Good evening.